So, so I'm online. I'm online. I see this ad. I can't resist it. I click the ad. This is what comes up. Check the screen. Here it is. Mike Chang's six-pack shortcuts. I mean, this guy's a great-looking guy. I mean, he, he's cut, right? I'm thinking, I'd like to look like that. Once I clicked on Mike Chang's website, Mike Chang began to stalk me. <laughs> and every time I went on YouTube, Mike Chang and his videos showed up. Every time I did a Google search, there he was, Mike Chang in my face. People would walk by my computer and they go, Pastor Mark, why is there a half-naked Asian man on your computer screen? <laughs>
This is the long way home. This way ended up taking 40 years. And not only does it not you know, take a long time, but it doesn't even go in the right direction. It's heading, it's heading south. Now, I know you look at that and you go, that just, just seems so bizarre to head them in the wrong direction. But God knew what was best for them, and, and he takes them this way. Now, things did not go well, because they start heading south instead of north, and as they go south, they end up running into the Red Sea. So they're trapped with the Red Sea on one side. That's bad enough. But what's on the other side? On the other side, we have Pharaoh who's changed his mind, and he's decided with his armies to pursue them and to kill them. Now they're trapped between the Red Seas and the armies of Pharaoh. And do you remember what happened? You remember what they said next, the children of Israel? You wonder where sarcasm came from? The Jews invented sarcasm. And out of their mouths came this, and I'll use my best Yiddish accent. What, Moses? There weren't enough graves in Egypt. You brought us out here to die in the wilderness already. I'm just imagining that's how they would have said it. Uh, full sarcasm, you get that, don't you? And uh, so they're be sarcastically repining. Of course, Moses doesn't know what to do. He lies down on the floor or on the ground, and he pleads with God, and God says, lead them forward. So God gives them this amazing miracle. Even though they were trapped in that place, the Red Sea divides. They go across on dry land, and when Pharaoh's army pursues, what does he do? He collapses the water, destroying the armies of Pharaoh. This is an incredible story. And then what happened, of course, now they have clean sailing. Now, now sure, they're in the wilderness, but at least they have clean sailing. They've, they've taken, they've vanquished the armies. And see, what would happen if they had gone north, if they'd gone the other way, the short way? Would Pharaoh's armies still have pursued them? The answer is yes. They still would have pursued. They would have had Pharaoh's army on one side, the Philistines' army on the other side. So even though that was the shorter route, it wasn't the, the, the best route for them. And so this was the route that they went. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about why you might want to choose the long way home. And so three things. Can I throw them up on the screen? Number one, the long way is usually the better way. Number two, the long way is often the harder way. Number three, the long way is sometimes the only way. Now, when we have the children of Israel going south instead of north, it wasn't the shortest way, but it was the better way. God said if they go to the north, he, this is what he said. He said, if they go to the north, they might see war and return to Egypt. Do you think if God said that they were going to do that, that maybe that's probably what they would have done? I mean, God always knows, and he knows what's best for them. And so he took them a long way because it was the better way, even though it was the longer way, and even it, though it was you know, maybe in some ways more painful. But he knew the other way wasn't actually going to get them there. And here's what I've learned about our culture. We live in a culture with a short-term mentality. We love shortcuts, just like I'm the shortcuts king. We love shortcuts. Now, here's what happens in life, is that we get presented with shortcuts in life every single day. And a lot of times, we take those shortcuts. Why? Because the ends justify the means. The problem with shortcut living is this, is that there are a lot of times there's compromises that have to be made. And, you know, there's a million different examples I could give you, but let me just give you one. One of the shortcut compromises that we take in life all the time is lying rather than telling the truth, because it's always easier, not always, but mostly easier to lie. Now, you know, it's not that we're pathological liars, we aren't, but you all get in those situations where it's just so much easier, if I just lie, I can move on. We call those little white lies, and you say, I don't tell those. You're lying right now by saying you don't tell those. <laughs> we all do it, we all do this. Officer, I'm sorry I was speeding, but I'm on the way to my house, the hospital, my wife's having a baby. Sir, your driver's license says you're 78 years old. <laughs> Still got it. <laughs> and so we, you know, we tell these, these little lies along the way, and, and sometimes, you all know what I'm talking about, right? Sometimes it's just so much easier to just fib a little, and then we don't have to deal with it. You know who got trapped? Even the best of us get trapped on that. You know who got trapped was Peter. Do you remember when Jesus was talking the night before he was betrayed and he was telling him, and he said, you know, this is going to happen and people are going to forsake me and betray me. And Peter stands up and he says, maybe others will forsake you. I'll be here. I'll never forsake you. He looks, looks to him and says, Peter, before the rooster crows twice tomorrow, you're going to deny me three times. So Jesus dies. He's crucified. The next day, what happens? A little servant girl comes up to Peter and says, hey, Hey, you're one of those disciples of, of Jesus from Galilee. Nope, 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 don't even know him. Three times he denies him. And then the rooster crows twice. And then he realized, even though he had so much conviction, what he did was he compromised and he lied because it was the easier thing to do. 
And the problem is, we, so many of us, we, we go through life with that, with that same mentality. It's so much easier for us to just compromise along our way and to say what we need to say to get us out of a particular situation. I, uh, I'm going to tell you this story that, where I fell into this trap, and it was a number of years ago, and I've been actually really good at declaring all of my income, regardless of where it comes from, but... But a number of years ago, I was doing my income tax, and I had this uh, tuition receipt. I'd been taking some seminary courses, and I had a tuition receipt, and so I entered it for the deduction, the tuition deduction. The only problem was this. I actually hadn't paid the tuition. The church had paid it for me, but they sent the tuition receipt to my name, and I went, sweet. This didn't cost me anything, and I get the deduction. And so I put it in my income tax. I sealed my, my envelope, and I put it on the counter. The next day, I was going to mail it. So I'm lying in bed, and this feeling came over me. I'm just trying to describe it. What do we call it? Guilt, <laughs> conviction, shame. You know what I'm talking about. Because more often than not, you know what the right thing to do is. You just don't want to do it. And I was lying there saying, but, I, but I, it's in my name. And I was trying to justify it, and I couldn't sleep, couldn't sleep. Finally, got up in the middle of the night, went downstairs, tore that envelope open, redid my entire income tax, sealed it back up, went up. Guess what? Slept like a baby. <laughs> you want to know something? Out of all the years I've been doing income tax, that was the only year I ever got audited. <laughs> that very year that I had changed it. And I don't know whether they would have caught me or not, but that's not the point. The question is this. You know what I saved? $30. It cost me $30 to tell the truth. What is your integrity worth? $30? No. $50 maybe, $100 for sure, but not $30. <laughs> right? And so, so when we look at our lives, we all do this. We all fall into this trap where we, we think about this thing about integrity, and we have to put integrity first, right? You know what the word integrity means? I'll tell you. Because let me throw it up on the screen. This is what the scripture says, first of all. It says, he who walks in, with integrity walks securely, but he who perverts his way will become known. And this is what I've discovered. When you compromise your integrity, you will be found out. The scripture promises, if you walk in integrity, you can always walk securely. But when you pervert your way, you are going to be discovered. See, who, who walks in integrity walks securely. I want to tell you the story of Cleveland Shroud. Uh, Cleveland Stroud, rather. Cleveland Stroud was a basketball coach in 1991 of a little basketball team in a high school in Rockdale, Georgia. And for the first time in their history, they had won the state championship. Now, that is a huge thing for any high school in any state anywhere. To win a state championship in any sport is a huge thing. And they were so excited, and they got the trophy, and they put the trophy in the trophy case in the school in Rockdale, Georgia. Two days later, he got a letter from his own school board saying that one of his players was academically ineligible because he hadn't completed his courses. Now, this man, this boy, had only played 45 seconds, did not determine the outgame, outcome of the game, but what Stroud decided to do was he decided that he was going to announce that their team was actually disqualified because of this, and they gave the trophy back, and the other team got the trophy. Everybody was mad at Coach Stroud. They said, all you had to do was keep your mouth shut. No one would have ever known. You know what he said? He said, I would have known. He said, I would have known. You have to do what is honest, and you have to do what is right, whether people are watching or not. And he gathered his team, and this is what he told. He said, this is why we did this. He said, people will never remember the scores of a basketball game, but they will always remember what you are made of. And he inspired these young, probably the greatest lesson he ever gave his team was not what he did on the court, but what he did off the court when he told them, you have to live in this thing called integrity. And you know what? He's a hometown hero. They don't have that trophy in their high school uh, trophy case. But what they've got is they've got a gym. Here's the picture. They've got a gym named after this man because he's a hometown hero who knew something about integrity and he inspired a generation by his example in his hometown. You see, that's what this is all about. We have a young generation of people coming up, young people, who are confronted with compromises and shortcuts every single day. You know that, don't you? And this is what I tell young people. This is what I tell my own children. And I, I, we raise them in this way. We say, you know what? You can't possibly foresee every challenge you're going to face and every compromise and every temptation you face every single day. 
And so what you can do is you can wake up in the morning and you can decide whatever I'm faced with this day, I will not take shortcuts, but I will always do the right thing. And what you've done is you've made a thousand good decisions in advance. All you have to do is make, do the right thing, whatever that. See, here's the thing. We always know what the right thing is. We're just not sure we want to do it, right? There's these four boys, they're late for a test. And when they arrive at school, the teacher says, how come you're late, boys? And they said, well, we had a flat tire on the way to school. And so uh, the teacher says, well, you only have five minutes in the class, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a makeup test, and you can do it right now. And they said, no, no, we don't have time. We have to get to our next class. And, they, and she said, no, no, don't worry about it. It's only going to be one question, and it's only going to be a couple of words. And so she went and she sat them in the four corners of the room, and the question was this, which tire was flat? <laughs> right? Busted. So the first thing is this, is that the long way is usually the better way. The second thing is that the long way is often the harder way. Now, sometimes in life, the long way is the easier way. That's why we take it. Uh, we live south of the city here, on the south side of the city here by the university. And if we're coming in highway number one from the east or from the west, most of the time what we'll do is we'll go around the perimeter. And it's actually the long way, but it's actually the easier way. I mean, there's not as many stop signs. You can, you can drive 140 kilometers an hour. I think that's the limit, <laughs> something like that. And uh, you know, it doesn't actually take us less time to get home, but it's easier, and it's less hassle, and so a lot of times that's the way we go. But when you look at life, a lot of times, often, the long way is actually not only longer, but it's actually harder. And when you look at Jesus' example, he actually told us not to take the easy route. He actually told us to take the hard route. Do you remember Matthew chapter 7? He said, enter by the narrow gate, and difficult is the way, difficult is the way that leads to life, and few are those that find it, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And so he said, this is what you need to do in life. You actually have to choose the difficult way. Now we hate that. Really? I thought, I thought you know, Christianity was going to keep me you know, fat, happy, and wealthy. Well, you know what? That is not the gospel. If you go read the gospel, he said, narrow is the gate, difficult is the way. Now, let me ask you this. Did Jesus choose the difficult way? Did he take the long way home? The answer is yes. You, you probably can figure out where I'm going with this. The answer is yes. I mean, when he came to earth, he was going to return home, right? He was going to go to heaven. Did he take the long way or the short, short way? Long way, easy way, or hard way? Hard way? Think about it. He got, he got d betrayed, arrested. He was beaten. He was stripped naked. He was humiliated. He was crucified. He died, and he still wasn't done. Then it says he not only ascended, but he first descended into the lower parts of the earth, and he was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's the long way home. And here's my question for you. Did he want to do it? No, you go read the story of the Garden of Gethsemane. The night before he was betrayed, he was sweating great drops of blood, and he prayed. And he said, Lord, if there is any other way, take this cup from me. He did not want to do it. He said, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And he took the long way home so that you and I could take the long way home. And, you know, I know that's a challenge for us. We say, I don't want to go the harder way. Well, sometimes the harder way is the right way. My point is this, and I don't want you to miss it, is that there are no shortcuts to success in life. There are no what we want, we demand, we want some instant way to deal with life, and we just want to take a pill and it all to go away. And if there was ever a culture that loves to take the pill, we're that, pre that culture, right? We have a pill. If you're overweight, we have a pill. If you're depressed, we have a pill. If you have high cholesterol, we have a pill. If you have high blood pressure, we have a pill. We have that little white pill that makes you feel, woo, a whole lot better when you get out of bed. Take one in the morning for the love of your head. <laughs> Whoa, sorry, a little flashback to the 70s five-man electrical band, for those of you that are wanting to know. <laughs> and, you know, we have all these pills, and, and people don't want to do things the hard way. We go to the doctor and say, do you have a pill? Do you have a pill that'll fix this? Because I don't want to deal with, you know, diet or exercise or anything. Just give me a pill. If I can take a pill, then that's a great shortcut for me. Have you seen these ads for these prescription drugs on television? You, they're, they're the Ask Your Doctor About series. They don't even tell you what the drug does. They tell you what it, well, it's not supposed to do, but they tell you that part. Ask your doctor about Lyrica. Side effects may be high blood pressure, heart disease, halitosis, hemorrhoids, 
cirrhosis, psoriasis, scoliosis, skin cancer, bladder cancer, kidney cancer, liver cancer, sexual dysfunction, depression, <laughs> diabetes, dysentery, diarrhea, and death. <laughs> huh? Maybe I'll ask the doctor about Lyrica. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. What does it do, anyway? Cures itchy, watery eyes. Sounds, sounds like it's worth it. I think I'll try some Lyrica. What is wrong with us? They list this, these side effects that are going to kill you, and we think, I think it's worth it. You know, these itchy, watery eyes are really bugging me. I'd rather have depression and diabetes, dysentery, diarrhea, and death. What is, what is wrong with us in our world? And we buy into this stuff. Now, just for the record, I've got to tell you this. I tell you embarrassing stories. This is one of my most embarrassing stories ever. You're going to hear it. Where I fell into this shortcut thing, literally. So I'm on my computer, and you know how those Google ads pop up, and there are videos and different things, and I see this Google ad for six-pack shortcuts, great abs shortcuts. And I think to myself, six-pack shortcut? I mean, who wouldn't want the shortcut to six-pack abs? Come on, guys. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> You all want, right, let me see your hands. How many of you would love a shortcut to six-pack abs? Well, you know, if, any, if anyone should know, I should know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And so, so, so I'm online. I'm online. I see this ad. I can't resist it. I click the ad. This is what comes up. Check the screen. Here it is, Mike Chang's six-pack shortcuts. I'm thinking, all right, I'm committed now. I'm going in. And so I go into his website to see, I mean, this guy's a great-looking guy. I mean, he, he's cut, right? I'm thinking, I'd like to look like that. And so, so I click on this. I go and I find out the, the six-pack shortcut. You want to know what the six-pack shortcut is? You want to know? Exercise! <laughs> his shortcut is exercise! He says this, that he has been working out every single day, all day long for his entire adult life, and that's why he looks like this. And if you, too, would work out all day long, every single day for the next five or six years, you, too, could have six-pack abs. <laughs> I'm thinking, that's discouraging. That is not a short cut. That is a long cut. Now, this isn't the worst part of the story, because once I clicked on Mike Chang's website, Mike Chang began to stalk me. <laughs> and every time I went on YouTube, Mike Chang and his videos showed up. Every time I did a Google search, there he was, Mike Chang in my face. People would walk by my computer and they go, Pastor Mark, why is there a half-naked Asian man on your computer screen? <laughs> I said, that's Mike Chang. <laughs> I said, why is Mike Chang? I said, I don't know. I can't get rid of him. And I was embarrassed. I thought, this is, you know, pastor, you know, it's not great. So I go to our IT guy, and I said, I got this guy on the, on the internet. He's stalking me. And so I showed our IT guy. I said, look, it's Mike Chang. He says, why do you have a half-naked Asian man on your computer? I said, I'm not telling you. It's none of your business. Just get rid of him. It's an embarrassing story. So he put some sort of ad blocker, Mike Chan blocker on there, you know, block, and he puts this thing on there. And so I'm pretty good. But then I decided this week that I'm going to use this story in my sermon. So I thought, I need a picture of Mike Chang. <laughs> Mike Chang's back, baby. <laughs> and I can't get rid of him. The long way is usually the better way. The long way is often the harder way, and you're getting it. And the last and the final thing is this, is that the long way is sometimes the only way. I said I was going to circle back to Joseph's bones. Joseph's bones, it's a, it's a bizarre kind of a story in here, this 430-year journey, and, of course, him coming. And when you look at his journey home, Joseph's journey long after he was dead, I want you to think about it, because his long journey home was actually the only way home. And if you look at everything that happened in his life, it was all for a reason. 
See, if he hadn't told his brothers of the dream, they wouldn't have sold him off as a slave. If they didn't sell him off as a slave, he wouldn't have ended up in Egypt. If he didn't end up in Egypt, he wouldn't have ended up in Potiphar's house. If he didn't end up in Potiphar's house, he wouldn't have been solicited by Potiphar's wife. If he hadn't rejected Potiphar's wife, he wouldn't have ended up in prison. If he didn't end up in prison, he wouldn't have interpreted the dreams. If he hadn't interpreted the dreams, he wouldn't have interpreted Pharaoh's dream. If he hadn't interpreted Pharaoh's dream, he wouldn't have become prime minister of Egypt. If he hadn't become prime minister of Egypt, his brothers would not have bowed down to him, thus saying, all of Israel. And so when they said that which you meant to, uh, for evil, I have, the Lord has meant for good. God took this long journey, the hard journey, and if you think about it, the only journey that he could have possibly taken to save his people, and he never finished it because he said, now you swear that you will take my bones back because we're all going back to Egypt, or sorry, back to Israel, even though I'm going to be long dead and gone. And so you see, sometimes the only way is the long way. Let me close with one final story here today. Some of you will know it. It's very much part of our North American history. It's the story of Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks was a little black lady living and working in Montgomery, Alabama. And in the 40s and in the 50s, there was bus segregation, meaning that the colored people, as they called them, would sit in the back of the bus and the white people would sit in the front. And this went on for years and years and years in Alabama. It was part of their culture. Well, it was 1943, and it was pouring rain, and Rosa Parks was on her way home from work that day. And when the bus stopped, she immediately, without thinking about it, she got on the bus, but she got in the front door, and the blacks were supposed to get in the back door. And she got in the front door, and the driver, James Blake, said, you can't come into this door, and you have to go in the back door, and you have to sit at the back of the bus. In a moment of protest, she sat down in a seat just for a moment and then got back up, making a statement. She got off the bus, he closed the doors and drove off, leaving her in the rain. She walked home in the rain that night. She took the long way home. Rosa Parks rode that same bus for the next 12 years. And every single night with the same bus driver, James Blake, she got on the back of that bus. On December 1st, 1955, she was on her way home, and she was sitting in the colored section, in the very first row of the colored section. And what happened was the bus had become overcrowded, and there wasn't enough seats for all the white people, and James Blake walked to the back of the bus, and he said, we're moving the colored row back one to make more room for the white people. And Rosa Parks decided she was not going to move. And she sat there, and so therefore the bus sat there, and he wouldn't drive, and he phoned the cops, and the cops came and arrested her and hauled her off to jail, and she was fingerprinted, and she spent the night in jail, or in other words, she took the long way home once again. Now what happened is it sparked what's called the Alabama uh, bus boycott. And the black people from that day forward did not ride the bus. They boycotted it. And it became a big, 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 big deal in Montgomery, Alabama. And it went on and dragged on for 381 days. Over a year, this dragged on. Eventually, it ended up into the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional to segregate people. And there was a little black woman who changed all of history and sparked the civil rights movement because she took the long way home. Sometimes the long way is the only way. In this, on December 21st, 1956, just a little over a year later, Rosa Parks got on that same bus and sat in the front seat. That's what happens when you determine to take the long way home. What does that mean for us? That means that we need to consider when we need to take the long way home. The long way home is usually the better way. The long way home is often the harder way. The long way home is sometimes the only way. And if we're going to make a difference in our life, we have to stand true and stand firm because Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate because difficult is the way that leads to life. Let's take the long way home today, all right? Church of the Rock has services every Sunday at 1397 Buffalo Place, and we invite you to join us when you're in the Winnipeg area. 
If you'd like a booklet to help you understand more about God's gift of forgiveness and reconciliation through Jesus Christ, please contact us and we'd be happy to send you a free copy of the Book of Hope. Visit our website at www.churchoftherock.ca. Thank you for watching and God bless you.